Hi, my name is Irene Gabriel. I'm from Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and I will be discussing the PROMISE study. So, as we know, most of us, by the time we're diagnosed with multiple myeloma, the patient has symptoms, they have bone pain, fractures, anemia, renal failure, and then they go see their doctor and then they get treated. But what if we change that completely? What if we change the way we think of cancer? detect it early, screen for it, and then completely change the way we think of multiple myeloma with early detection, early interception, and potentially cure for myeloma. And with that, we wanted to do that in the United States to ask whether we can screen for the first time for multiple myeloma. Now we know that multiple myeloma is more common in black Americans or African Americans, as well as people who have a first degree relative with multiple myeloma. So we actually designed the study to ask whether we should screen high risk individuals and not the general population. And with that in mind, we've screened so far 7,622 people, including 2,211 from the prospective PROMISE study, which is basically asking people to go online, promisestudy.org, and if you meet the eligibility criteria, whether you are African American or whether you have a first degree relatives, then you can get a kit and go get screened at home. We also collaborated with the Mass General Brigham, which is basically a large number of hospitals, clinics, as well as primary care physicians who just see people here in the New England area. And we got samples that meet exactly the same criteria of the PROMISE study from 5,411. So total of high-risk individuals that meet the criteria are 6,305 of those we have the largest cohort of Black Americans who have screened so far of 2,439 and another 3,866 with a strong family history of blood cancer. We also put some <clears throat> cases as um, control, a negative family history of 631 whites, uh, and then another 686 white people without uh, evidence of knowing whether they have a family history or not. Now, what we decided to do is we will collaborate with Binding Site to ask for the first time if we do mass spectrometry by quantitative. So here we're using their new method <clears throat> of artificial intelligence, mass spectrometry quantification, to ask the question whether we can really look at the very deep level of monoclonal gamopsy if we can detect it at an early time point. And I'm just putting this in perspective. If you think about, in general, the population that Dr. Kyle has shown us for many years, we have a monoclonal gamopsy by serum protein electrophoresis of 3% if you, have, uh, if you are over the age of 50. But this was mainly in uh, a almost all white community in Offset County. Here, if we just use the same serum protein electrophoresis, so the same more traditional method of standard of care, you will find that our population has twice the numbers, which is consistent with what has been reported before, so 6%. If you go to mass spectrometry and use a cutoff that you would have otherwise found it also by serum protein electrophoresis, but because mass spectrometry is much more sensitive, we found that it's 14%. And if you look specifically at the Black Americans, it was 17%. And then everything that was below that, but was still quantifiable by mass spectrometry as a monoclonal protein and actually confirmed by LCMS, which is an even more sensitive test. We didn't want to say that this is MGUS because it's unlikely that it is truly MGUS. We didn't want to call it pre-MGUS because we don't know that it will go on all the way to MGUS. So we coined the name monoclonal gamopsy of indeterminate potential so that we can understand better what are those early monoclonal proteins and they're truly monoclonal, but we're trying to understand what they mean. And in fact, we had 42% of the population over the age of 50, remember these are high risk individuals that had the monoclonal protein. And this opens the question of asking so many things. What are those early monoclonal proteins? Which ones progress later on to MGUS or myeloma? Which ones don't? Which ones uh, go on to cause autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular disease and others? What we know is when we followed those people because the MGB cohort has a 10 years of follow-up, but even with a median follow-up of 4.5 years, you see that there was a worse overall survival from all-cause mortality, meaning people had a shorter life uh, when they had either monoclonal gamopsy or when you're older than age 65, even when they had this monoclonal gamopsy of indeterminate potential or MGIP. That tells us that many of those people are dying from other things, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and so on. And we need to see whether those early monoclonal proteins 
are indicative of inflammation, of immune changes, of the immune microenvironment changing that allows inflammation, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune diseases, other things happening, and potentially we can prevent those. We can actually detect this early monoclonal protein and start tracking our patients and potentially even giving them something to prevent uh, early mortality. So lots of things to be known in the future, lots of asking questions about what to do with all of those monoclonal proteins, but also understanding that the prevalence is so high in high-risk individuals, even if you take the higher cutoff, 14%, 13% is a very high number compared to what we used to think of as 3%. And that starts asking the question whether in the future we will start screening more and more people to detect monoclonal protein so that we don't wait until you have multiple myeloma and then we detect it. So with that, I will end and hopefully we will open more discussions about MGUS and MGIP.